Good afternoon. Welcome back, everybody. Um, second part of my presentation, still around that best practice theme about VLUs and best practice. But we concentrated very much before lunch on the times and wound bed preparation and what was important, you know, yes, wound products, wound um, dressings and compression therapy are vitally important. But unless we remove those barriers in the first instance, it's a little bit like we could put that on a bit of a brick wall and um, doesn't be as effective. So again, I know I'm talking to, to, to colleagues out there that, that are already carrying that out and I'm just reiterating that to you, but certainly what best practice does is, um, as I said, it's not just Joy Tickle standing up here and harping on about best practice. It can help you to challenge practice in your areas as well. So for instance, if I talk about anything today that is not available to you in practice, it will give you the evidence that you can go back and say, well, you know, maybe when I talk about hosiery kits in a minute, that, that you can say, well, this is best practice. The evidence is there and it really would help us and our patients in, in long term management and freeing up your resources. So hopefully it's a tool to help you to um, challenge, which I know can be uncomfortable, but certainly give you the evidence so you can support that challenge. So we're going to look now at, at the um, best practice around compression therapy. And again, that, that's saying that every moment does matter. The aim of the se session, and I do apologise, it's a sign of my age, glasses on, glasses off. So if it's a little bit off-putting, I do apologise. I try my best to see it without the glasses. But we're going to look at key points of the best practice statement, okay? We're going to ask you questions again, so there is the voting pad if you've got them. Fab. It's anonymised. I don't know who's voting. My colleagues have come back on the front row, so I didn't put you off too much. Thank you. Um, we're going to explore a leg ulcer treatment pathway that can support you guys in practice with your clinical decision making. It's not prescriptive. It's not to take away your professional and clinical judgment. It's to guide you. It's to guide you in that decision making. Okay, and we're going to share then the impact of that approach. So I'm going to actually share with you where the best practice has been put into different areas and what were the outcomes of that, which then can assist you in your own practice, unless you're already doing it. So why was the best practice statement developed? It was a meeting of, as I've said earlier, of UK clinicians, um, you know, from uh, podiatrists to vascular specialists to wound care specialists, tissue viability. We came together, and yes, I was one of the panel on the best practice statement because I feel really passionate about VLUs and management long-term of chronic leg ulcers. And we wanted to give you clear treatment pathways, assist your clinical decision-making, which I've just said, but also to help with you having that consistency because show of hands, how many of you get to see the same patient twice in a week? You know, particularly community staff where we are, it, thank you and I'm glad you do because then that patient has that consistency, you have that continuity with that patient and knowing that wound. But unfortunately, I know where I work, that, that doesn't happen all the time. So we want to give you working frameworks, um, clinical tools that help your decision making so all of your team can use it and we're all assessing and managing the patient in the same manner. Okay, so we wanted to give you a usable document, not something that's just going to sit on the shelf and you think, oh yeah, that's the best evidence, but what does that mean to me in practice? Very much what we wanted to look at as well is real-time solutions, and we know in today's NHS arena, as I've talked to you about pressures that we're all facing in our workplace, but what, how can we free up some of those pressures or help you in freeing up some of those pressures? So I'll talk about that. And the, the statement what, which we um, looked at, we wanted to address in a manner of myths and truths. Um, by that, you'll see throughout the document, there's, there's uh, lots of red and green boxes, and the myths are in red. Now, those myths you may read, and I did, and one of those myths, for instance, was um, you never used a superabsorbent under compression. I was taught that. I was actually taught that and given the evidence about five, six years ago. 
That doesn't mean I was wrong. That was the only evidence available to us. So now what we've done is brought the evidence to, to, to current day and address that in myths and truths. So the myths are not there as a criticism. It's saying practice has changed, evidence has changed. So there's lots of myths and truths throughout that document as well. Um, so we'll go through that with you. So back to you guys now. I know you've had lunch. Okay, so if you can vote for me, what is the definition of a leg ulcer? Is it any wound below the knee that takes longer than six weeks to heal, that takes longer than four weeks to heal, a wound between the knee and the ankle that remains unhealed after two weeks, or none of the above? Again, I don't know who's voting. It's anonymised. It's just there to aid a little bit of discussion. So please vote. Don't feel that, I, I, you know, it's not judgmental. You're also quiet now you've had your lunch. That could be a good or a bad thing. So some of you are reluctant to vote on this one, I think. But I'm going to go in and, uh, unless your voting pads are playing up, then that, that's the other reason. So I'll give you a little bit longer. Okay, let's have a little look. Okay, any wound below the knee that takes longer than six weeks, 38% of you said that, and four weeks, 24% said that. I, I would have agreed with both of those, because that's the evidence we were give, given a year ago, two years ago, it was four weeks, and a few years before that was six weeks. But currently, best practice now, from all of the evidence, so not just the panel of people sat together, they delved through all of that evidence, it's a wound between the knee and the ankle that remains unhealed after two weeks. And what the best practice panel suggests also is that any wound on the lower limb should be assessed really from day one, week one, not waiting till week two. So again, that, that can cause a little bit of discussion between you, but we're just bringing best practice and evidence to you. So a venous leg ulcer is defined as an open lesion between the knee and the ankle joint that occurs in the presence of venous disease. Uh, bearing that in mind, it's a disease that the patient has and takes more than two weeks to heal. And that is endorsed by NICE as well. But from the evidence, that is what we're now deemed as best practice, as a best practice statement. Patients, in, uh, particularly patients with a history of VLUs and assessment and treatment of a new lesion on the leg should start really from ASAP, from day one, not week two. Okay. Any of the practice nurses or pe uh, people in the audience who see patients with pretibial lacerations, I'm sure they present quite commonly, come through the door with trauma injuries, car doors, the summer, gardening tools, bites, treat them as potentially a leg ulcer. Okay. Now I know we're talking specifically venous disease, but the trauma wounds, the pretibs, all those types of wounds, if deemed suitable, those limbs and those wounds will respond very well to compression. Okay, so don't just think compression VLUs. Think for compression, for edema management, for those acute wounds that will potentially become your chronic leg ulcer. Okay, and that's what we, we agreed with as well. So on your caseload, so this is not a right and wrong answer. It's for me, it's for us to get a little bit of discussion. What's the longest duration of a patient on your caseload um, with a leg ulcer? So in your clinic, in your caseload, in your practice, in your home, if you're in care homes, if you can vote now. Again, this is very subjective. It depends on where you work um, and what, what it is you actually do. But I'm sure I'm talking to everybody that's interested in wounds or else you probably wouldn't be here today. I'm going to end that one now. We'll have a little look. Yeah, and I, and I think we've all agreed with that, haven't we? The majority of the audience, longer than two years. So, I'm not, so the evidence that's out there about chronicity of two years, you're agreeing with, really, because it's, it's a reality in your practice, isn't it? And that's not because we're getting things wrong. It's just because, you know, it's, it's lots of other elements around that holistic assessment, but also the pressures we're under as well. And I'll be the first to say, you know, I am not, I don't get everything perfect at all, um, but how we can work together. 
But you can see on average, there's a lot of patients there with wounds for over 12 months or 12 months and more. Reality, I've already touched on this, 730,000 patients, and I think that's underestimated, if I'm honest. I think there's lots of patients with leg ulcers that are unreported. They self-care, um, or family or carers care for them, and they're very much under the radar. I see uh, a few patients who are living on the streets, and they have significant limb ulceration, or potentially foot ulceration, that we're unaware of. Okay. We know 1.5%. Remember that 16% of cases only undertaken an ABPI. But I think now the new machines, the new portal machines, are assisting with that assessment process. So again, I will say that ABPI is part of a full holistic assessment, but the new machines are assisting us as clinicians and you as practitioners to undertake those ABPIs more easily and more quickly. The bit that, that um, uh, stayed with me around guests' earlier work in 2015 was 26 to 69% of the patients we heal, or the patient heals and we assist, of a VLU will reoccur. So all that hard work, it almost seems a bit of a, oof, you know, some of these patients are going to reoccur. And I'll talk to you on another slide why that may be. So... Why is compression therapy then, com therapeutic compression, effective in the management of venous leg ulcers? If you can vote now, does compression aims to counteract the force of gravity and uh, promote the normal flow of venous blood up the leg? Compression improves arterial supply of the foot. Compression helps with wound debridement and compression reduces the need for antimicrobials. If you can vote now. Yeah, top answer is the correct one. Compression aims to counteract the force of gravity and promotes the normal flow of venous blood up the leg. Um, so, for, for example, as I said earlier, we have that raised engorgement of the venous system where we have that pooling of fluid and blood in the lower part of the leg. By applying compression, therapeutic compression, in the correct manner, we gently squeeze that calf, we squeeze the superficial vessel, uh, veins that force the blood into the deep veins and back up to the heart. Okay, so it's that cycle. Without that, we will have that pooling and that high, high raised pressure in the lower limb. Hence, compression is for life. Okay, venous disease is for life. Um, so a, a quick recap then, as I've already um, spoke about, therapeutic compression acts on the venous, but not just venous, think about your lymphatic system, you know, it, it equally does help to improve the lymphatic drainage um, and return, so then that helps with reducing edema as well. So let's not forget compression therapy doesn't stop at the knee if needed. If there's edema above the knee or noticeable varicosities above the knee, we should be compression to the thigh. Okay, so we treat the whole of the limb. Patients with DNS disease will experience slow healing wounds. They will until compression, full therapeutic compression is applied. And venous disease is progressive. Okay, and without compression or, and good skin management, um, you know, ulceration, edema, skin changes. You've seen your patients with venous disease who've had um, that raised pressure over a long period of time. What they'll notice is not an ulcer, they may hopefully never have ulcerated. Okay, the ulcer is one of the last things you will see with, if that venous disease has not uh, improved. Um, what you'll see is chronic skin changes. So you might see the brown staining to the lower part of the leg, and that's called hemosiderine staining, and that's depositing of the iron in the red blood cells because of the raised pressure in the venous system. It will never go away. I have patients saying, will this brown staining leave my leg? No, it won't. That's skin damage. But it will prevent it getting worse if we compress that limb and aid the venous return. The patients may report that they get, since they've had problems with their legs, might have started after their third child was born, their legs became very, a little bit swollen, skin was always never quite the same. 
it was, it, I always suffered with a bit of eczema or dry skin on my leg. That's related to venous disease and the raised pressure in there. So those are the sorts of things we can prevent. So, again, this is not a right and wrong answer. This is for discussion. What compression system do you use most often where you work for the first line of therapy? So you may use all of those systems, but what is your first choice, your first line of, of treatment? Is it the short stretch bandage system? So, for example, Actico, Actico 2C, four-layer compression therapy, the two-layer system, such as your K2, Ergo K2, uh, Ergo K2, um, ergo range, compression hosiery kits, or reduced compression systems. What's your first line of choice? And again, that choice may not be, it may be what's only available to you. I appreciate that. We all don't have an, an infinitive box of everything we can use. I do get that in practice. Okay, so again, let's have a little look. So, a mixture, and I expected that. I absolutely did expect that. So, quite a lot of you are using your two-layer systems, which we do in Shropshire, okay? Whatever make that is, whatever manufacturer that is. Short stretch, we use quite a lot of short stretch in, in Shropshire. Um, Four-layer still, yes. Compression hosiery kits, brilliant. Nice to see that some of you are, only 6%, using your hosiery kits as a form of full therapeutic compression for wound healing but I'll give you the evidence about that in a minute and reduced compression and we w have got a slide on reduced compression so I'm not going to ask questions about why there yet I do understand why and next one when would you use reduced compression systems then when would you recommend them and I'm sorry the R and the E has gone off the recommend okay if you can vote, do you recommend reduced compression for patients with mixed etiology? So they've got a, a, a Doppler or ABPI of less than 0.8. Patients who cannot tolerate full compression or both of the above. Let's have a little look at that. I think I know what's coming. Yeah, definitely reduced if your patient has what we call mixed etiology. So they've got venous disease, but equally there's an element of arterial disease. So we're erring on the little bit of caution there. And I would say with the patients with mixed etiology, be talking to the, your wider team. You know, use your MDT team, use your vascular nurse specialists, your TVNs, your leg ulcer specialists if need to, okay? The reduced compression element may have come from a vascular consultant or from your TVN, but that's normally the rationale. And I agree, patients who cannot tolerate full compression, okay, and I have used that myself. Why would you, um, so for what reasons might patients not tolerate full compression? So both of the above, you know, most of you have said that. Pain. Pain. Pain's a big one, isn't it? You know, the limb is uncomfortable. The wound is painful, and, and I have myself looked at a patient and thought, she's not going to tolerate full compression. Okay, get that, totally get that. When do you step them up then to full compression? A week? Two? Two months? What do you say to it? Yeah. But what indicates then? The pain's under control? Yeah, yeah. It's hard though, isn't it? Because my the reason I asked that question is you're right. Two week rule. Have a look. We've got to aim to get them into full therapy. If it's a true VLU, a lot of the pain is coming from the engorgement in the venous system. So if we can reverse that, the pain will get easier. But I understand if the patient's in pain and we apply compression, they can actually want to rip that off because it's more painful. So my colleague over the way was right. Get the pain under control, but always set a timed date when you're going to review and, potential, and tell your patients from day one. This is reduced compression. My aim is we will get into full compression because your wound will heal more quickly or your venous problems will resolve more quickly. 
Okay, but I, I see it in practice, and, I, and we, you know, in Shropshire, we get it wrong, not so much get it wrong, is time goes, doesn't it? I mean, somebody told me it's so many weeks to Christmas at break, and I was like, really? But it, how quickly does time go from one minute you see a patient and the next? And I see patients in reduced compression for, these re for the reason due to discomfort and pain, true VLU, and three months later, they're still in reduced we haven't set that date to say with the patient right can we now increase that and that delays the wound healing it doesn't stop it but it will delay it and also you could significantly improve your patient's pain if we can get a little bit more compression on because you're going to reduce the venous hypertension reduce the engorgement and reduce the edema so myths and truths I talked about in the in the statements reduce compression is therapeutic for VLUs Yes, some compression is better than none, and I will always say that, okay? But really, set your objectives with the patient. When are we going to aim to get in full compression as, as the assessment deemed it was suitable to do so? And I'll give you an example, and it's a true example. This is a 64-year-old gentleman, okay? Picture on the top uh, of there. He's been presenting to the GP frequently um, over the last eight years. He presented in 2010 with swelling, started with really noticeable swelling, causing impact on his mobility. But he was still mobile, but it was causing problems. He was prescribed multiple antifungal infections because of the fungi in the skin folds. You can see that there. That causes significant, I don't know if you can, significant problems. The toes, the digits, all the skin folds. The fungi love it. The bacteria love it, but the fungi will love that well. The edematous and the hypertension, the, the venous hypertension causes these chronic inflammation of the skin. Not infection, not cellulitis, chronic inflammation that then causes the skin changes. It can lead to hyperkeratosis, but it can equally lead to those dry, scaly skin plaques becoming wet. When they become wet, the bacteria can burrow underneath them. And have you ever lifted those plaques off and it's been wet underneath? And the patient says you've made it worse because you've picked joy. I've had you know, it isn't worse, that's what is underneath those dead skin cells, okay? And that's what was happening with this gentleman. He had frequent antibiotics, numerous courses of antibiotics, but he actually wasn't infected. It was inflamed due to chronic venous hypertension, okay? He was admitted to hospital with cellulitis. I'll ask you a question, is bilateral cellulitis common? It's as rare as rare can be. So on the acute wards, guys, if you get or medical, wherever you work, if you have somebody who's coming into you with bilateral cellulitis, just query it is true cellulitis. It's normally inflammatory skin changes and inflammation. Okay. But you can understand then the impact on the patient, the impact on resources to manage that patient. Okay. The bit that struck home to me, this man lived alone, self-caring, could shop, look after himself, clean, loved to play dominoes at the local pub, loved to go to the local cafe, until the point when the people in the shop and the cafe asked him to leave because of the smell. So to me, that's the biggest impact. So as a consequence of his legs becoming worse, mobility being affected, and his confidence, he became socially isolated. Until in 2017, yet again, he went back to the GP because he thought he had an infection and the, wound, the legs were leaking again. And it was a locum GP that said, hold on a minute. If you're not ever seen, especially TVN, leg ulcer, vascular, lymphedema, anybody with your legs? No, I haven't. So we referred, this is not my patient, it's my colleague's patient. So we referred this patient to the tissue viability service. And using best evidence and best practice, they looked at the guidance of not just compression, but the times. He got a lot of hyperkeratosis, as you can see. He got a lot of devitalized tissue. Okay? Now, as I said, I'm a picker. And I would have loved to have drawn my stool up and picked at that. But time, and I don't want to encourage any more skin breakdown or trauma, I'm paying for the patient. So with good cleansing and uh, using the monofilament pads that we talked about, very gently, he could do that himself, okay? Whilst I was prepared, or the clinician was preparing other things. The TVM put this program in place. The district nurses implemented it. 
So he had the um, monofilament debris soft pads for the hyperkeratosis. We used a super absorbent dressing, the Flivazol Pro, because they were exuding, okay? But the main important part was he went into compression bandaging. So now you can start to see the difference. And this is in seven weeks of therapy. How many years? Anybody remember? Seven. Seven. Seven years of on and off and on and off and debilitation into seven weeks. Okay? From bandaging to hosiery. Really simple. And again, it isn't Joy Tickle harping on. It wasn't the TVN harping on. The TVN implemented best practice guidance. Um, but it doesn't have to be a TVN to implement that. I've seen lots of nurses, practice nurses, hospital staff, district nurses who implement that every day. Okay, so please don't think that I'm saying it has to be specialist. Can you imagine the impact on his life now? He can go out, he can socialise, he looks normal, is his words. Yes? <coughs> no, actually, he did still go to... I totally agree with you. So yeah. Effect, yeah. Yeah. Fast, yeah. I see frequently as the legs begin to swell, patient's legs or uh, begin to swell, mobility becomes an issue. So mobility becomes an issue so they can't then get up and down the stairs or in and out of bed. So they stop doing it. So then they sit in a chair and it's not necessarily a recliner chair and if it's a recliner chair they only recline it so far. We get a dependent edema, which rightfully so, my colleague said there. That adds and exacerbates the problem, and then we're left with even bigger limbs. So the pro Sorry? Yeah. But it, to be honest with you, he was going to bed. But he got such problems. But I agree. Look at the environment. It's all well and good. Let's say that patient wasn't going to bed. Okay, for whatever reasons. And we go in and we do the same best practice guidance and put in compression bandaging and, and um, de you know, debriding and leave him and he still sits in a chair. We're not solving the problem, are we, long term? So you're right, we have to address the environmental issues as well. They may be the bed, the equipment. His mobility might need physio, might need OT. There's lots of other factors that can assist this gentleman. But it really was down to getting you know, the right practice, the right person, the right time, and what a difference it made. Challenging assumptions then, um, I've just talked to you at all about that. I'm not going to go through it again. You know, we now know a leg ulcer is present, is, is confirmed, having remained on heel for two weeks, but I still will say, hands up, from day one, in my opinion, full compression is really, really the way we should be going for a true VLU or venous disease. So let's hope we don't see the ulcer. We see a patient with venous disease. We put them in compression. We don't put them in. We advise them about compression. We facilitate compression. And we don't get a venous leg ulcer. Okay. And compression injury can be used as a first line of treatment. And I'm going to talk more about that now as well. So, as part of the best practice statement, as I said, the panel wanted to look at any um, tools that could assist you. Again, tools that you can adapt, not set in black and white, but tools you can use, adapt the times or any sort of tools. And this leg ulcer treatment algorithm was one that was um, deemed by the panel as, as best practice and implemented into best practice statement. But I'm going to confess here of how this best practice um, leg ulcer treatment algorithm, which has now been rolled out nationally um, across the UK, Scotland and Wales, um, came about. And I'd love to say it was really technical, but it was two people who after conference one day, and it was a conference around lower limb ulcerations, sat in the bar and said, I'm a bit confused about the right treatment here if we've got one person saying this we've got one paper saying this and this is just venous leg ulcers and we're specialists in our own right and we're confused we need to make it simpler because this is not not good really and out came a serviette and a bottle of wine and a glass of wine later myself and my colleague Leanne Atkin who's a vascular nurse specialist um, she's a doctor now in Huddersfield scribbled down an algorithm. Now, I'd love to say that was it, but it wasn't. There was work gone on around that. 
And it was a doc we, we did it for our own practice and to share. So we wrote it up, we published it, we said to everybody, use it, share it. Okay, and then we've adapted it slightly since, and we've just relaunched it again with the slight adaptations. But it was accepted as good practice because of its simplicity. And I think that's the thing. It's not rocket science. You can put your products in it. For instance, um, the algorithm we use in Shropshire actually names the products we talk about in that algorithm. Okay, or you can have it as generic. And, and I'll talk you through that in a minute of how, how it works. There are copies in the best practice statement. You can download this separately if you just put in Legal's algorithm at Kin and Tickle. Um, and you can get that. And equally, you will have this on your seats or should have this on your seats. And there's a pocket guide. So it's really, really simple. And, and once you've used it a couple of times, can I be honest, you won't need it. You won't need the pocket guide. It really is that simple. So how did we come to the decisions in this Legal's algorithm? Yes, we looked at evidence out there. But the one thing that really stuck in my mind, and it certainly did with Leanne, is a big RCT study in 2014 called the Venus 4. Any of you heard of the Venus 4 study? And you know, the sad thing was that in 2014, that study took place, and it was a really large randomised controlled trial across the UK, multiple sites, and it was comparing compression therapy four-layer bandaging with a, a compression hosiery kit and healing rates. It looked at other factors, and I, but I'm just picking out certain parts, and please go and read around that. It was published in The Lancet, and it was a really renowned piece of work. So we looked at that. I looked at that in 2014, and I'd like to say, because I'm just one of those people who have lots of things at the side of my bed, and I love to read them, no, not really. I looked at that because of a crisis in our uh, teams, where winter pressures and everything else, but I think it's not winter pressures anymore, it's all year round pressures. We had a GP who said, Joy, um, well, a practice nurse who rang me up and said, Joy, our GP's refusing for us to apply compression bandaging because we haven't got time. After you picked me up off the floor, I was like, What do you mean? And he said, Well, we haven't got time. Compression bandaging is taking too long in our practice. And we have 15 patients, all in bandaging, etc. We've got these winter pressures. So he's telling us, and you know, okay, I've got evidence. And my director of nursing rang me up and said, Joy, can you go and sort this problem out? And I said, Look, I'm not Harry Potter. I don't have a magic wand, you know, but I'll go and speak to them. I can't force them. I have no jurisdiction, you know, but I can talk about what is best practice for VLUs. So off I went to this practice, and of course the nurses were like, What are we going to do? We know we should be compressing these patients. And I just come across the Venus 4 study, and the Venus 4 study said in the results overall that the average or median time to healing, sorry, not the average, in a four layer bandage kit. So, patients, cohort of patients in four layer, cohort of patients in a hosiery kit, and it was the Activa hosiery kits or Acti Lymph hosiery kits they were in. The median time to healing was 98 days in the four layer bandage and 99 days in, two ho in the hosiery kits. So, there's only one day difference. And the ulcers healed with 70.4% in the bandage and 70.9% in the hosiery kit. And the bit that stuck to me, though, was recurrence rates. Recurrence rates of the patients cared for in the four-layer bandaging was 23%. And this study followed the patients for 12 months, not just a few weeks. But in the hosiery kits, recurrence rates was only 14 And that actually was a light bulb moment for me when we talk about reoccurrence rates of VLUs. Why do you think patients reoccurred less in the hosiery kits than they did the bandaging? They so Yeah, I've, I've, I've clocked a couple of points there. Um, they associated this with the healing of the wound. So when the heal also healed, they said, well, carry on with that because it healed. We put somebody in a bandage up until the point of healing and then give them hosiery. They'll wear it for a short time but then they'll take it off because they're not. And, and I think that that's just my philosophy of that. There's no evidence to prove that. But from seeing it in my own practice since we introduced this in 2014, it, it, it did. And, and so anyway, long story short, I went and saw those. I didn't see every 50 of those 15 patients. I sat with the practice nurse. We used the Legal algorithm. That's all we did with the patient's story and, and measurements and Dopplers. And we went through, and those patients that could 
deemed suitable for uh, hosiery kits, we put in hosiery kits, still with wound dressings. Those that require bandaging, and let me say, compression bandaging, we do need. Okay, so the patients with the larger limbs, heavily exuding wounds, large, larger wounds, remained in bandaging. But with a view that when we use the algorithm and keep reassessing the patients, when the limb distortion restored and exudate levels reduced, they went into the hosiery kits. Does that make sense? Out of the 15 patients, 13 went into hosiery kits because they were suitable, according to the evidence, and one refused to go in hosiery kits and wanted back, no, no compression, and two, I get that right, 40, no, one remained in bandaging, okay, with a view. And about two weeks later, I had a phone call from the practice nurse and said, Joy, I've got a problem. And I was like, oh, God. You know, when you think, where's my P P60? I think I'm going to need, or P45, is it? I'm going to have to find another job. Um, and I said, what? She said, well, the patient's in the hosiery kits. And I went, yeah. She said, well, they're actually cancelling appointments. And I went, what do you mean? And she said, well, they're saying, oh, it's just so simple. We'll come in once a week, but the rest of the time, if you'll show my wife, husband, or me how to do it, a simple dressing, I'll do it myself. Is that okay? Is that all right? It is, isn't it? Is that wrong? Sure. With guidance? And I said, fine. As long as you're monitoring the patient and the wound in case there are any changes, and the patient in bandaging, one patient did go back into did go from the hosiery into bandaging. I'm not saying it was all, you know, because the edema increased, so they went into compression bandaging. Um, and that was in 2014, and I've got a little bit of a soft spot for, the, for that cohort of patients, so I keep ringing up every six months. They think I'm a stalker, and I ask the practice nurse. How any of them patients been back yet? Because they went on to heal, and not one, and with 2018, has reoccurred. So they do do an aftercare. You know, they do see the patients, as we should, gold standard, every 12 months, reassessment, revascular assessment. But it, it was just suddenly, I was saving, we were saving nurses valuable clinic time. Patients were happy, because actually we were giving them a choice. Would you like that? Or would you like that? Can I have that? You know, suddenly, I was taught bandaging was up until the point of healing and two-week post. But that's what I was taught years ago. And evidence and research comes a long way. And let us bring that to you. We're not expecting you to, to read it all. But now, we've got choices. Our patients have choices. To apply compression bandaging, you have to be trained. So, yes, associate practitioners can be trained. But ma majority are qualified staff. Do I need a qualified member of staff to put this full compression on? Full 40 millimetres of pressure compression? No, I don't. Can my patients do it? Yes, they can. So, again, it's, it's rethinking about the demands on us now. And that doesn't mean you as clinicians are sat there twiddling your thumbs, drinking tea, or when I was a district nurse told I was going home to peg the washing out every day. Yeah, that's how the imagined district nurses worked. We are busy doing other things, looking at prevention of comorbidities or managing patients with the comorbidities, caring for those patients who pain is uncontrolled and we're struggling to get them into compression. We've got more time to facilitate that holistic assessment. So let's have a little look at what we've learned so far. So this is a case study. This is an elderly female patient. Glasses on. Sorry, I know it's coming. Um, with a history of venous ulceration. Extensive ulcers, as you can see, on the outer aspect of the left leg. Present for four months. Reduced compression due to pain. I get that. Exudate levels are high. ABPI is, is suitable for compression. So what factors do you think, guys? Looking at the image, looking, I know you've only got a short pricey of that patient, but just shout out to me, what factors do you think are stopping or, or delaying that wound from moving on? The slough. So straight away in your head, you've gone times. I'm sure you have, haven't you? Yeah. You've gone tissue. Straight away, you've gone to that tissue without you even thinking about it. But you're right. That tissue, that slough, that devitalised tissue is going to delay that wound healing. Even if the patient's in compression, isn't it? It's going to delay it. So we need to address that. What else? Sorry, can you shout a bit louder? I'm not getting up. Sorry? 
moisture. Yeah, we've just put there, exudate levels are moderate to high. So, you know, we might combat that slough, but how are we going to keep that exudate level? It's a balance. Remember, we don't want to dry out those wound beds. We just want to get that moisture. So we want to take the excess moisture away into, uh, say, a super absorbent. What else is delaying it? Age, definitely, you know, so I know I haven't put any comorbidities up there. Age and the, and, and, uh, the process of wound healing, skin, the elderly skin, you know, it affects us all, I'm afraid, guys, but you know, can't stop it. But it is, it is an element, okay? And there may be other associated comorbidities, medication the patient may be taking that can impede or slow down the wound healing factors. Uh, or put them at a higher risk of infection, such as patients on high dose of immunosuppressants or immunosuppressant treatment. Any other factors then? Pain. Pain and reduced compression, yeah. Both together, she was put in reduced compression due to pain, and I get that. So how are we managing that pain then? Are we helping? Can we, can we as a team, I don't mean you individually, um, how can we get this lady's pain under control so we can get her into full compression? Okay, because the reduced compression is better than nothing, but it won't allow that VLU to, to improve as quickly as we would like. And I think you've got them all on there. I'm sure you have. Um, yeah, reduced compression. It's not always going to address the edema because the excess fluid, let's remember, could be coming from the limb as well as the wound itself. Potential then for infection and biofilms because of the sloughy tissue. So how are we going to debride that? Biofilms reform. So you've brushed your teeth this morning. I keep going on about brushing teeth, don't I? And you'll go home, have your glass of wine, beer, whatever you fancy, and you'll go to bed. <coughs> what did you do before you go to bed? Well, I don't really want to know that, actually. But what would you do hygiene-wise? You have a wash, what do you do? Brush your teeth. Why do you brush your teeth then? What can you feel on your teeth around about 10 o'clock tonight? <coughs> Probably feel those biofilms reforming, can't you? And by the morning, if you don't brush your teeth, because you might have one too many and you forget, you can almost see the biofilms on your teeth. It's the same with wounds. Okay, so if you've seen your patient twice a week, guess what's reformed in between you seeing that patient, potentially. Now, nice, clean, healthy, granulating wounds, you may not need to do that. I'm talking about the slough devitalised risk of biofilm wounds, okay? So what compression system can we use for this lady? You know about her, what can we use? Always a bit of a stickler there, isn't it? Some of my staff will go in and say, bandaging. Definitely bandaging all the way up to healing. And we do, don't we? Use your algorithm. Use an algorithm to assist you. Now, this algorithm doesn't just start there. It starts with the patient. I must add that. It doesn't just start with edema. I'm just showing you from the perspective of this lady. So use the algorithm that will guide you. It's a guide to make that decision of what type of compression you will use. For instance, uh, mild edema present. Um, there is um, severe, ed or se severe edema. Ecudate is not controlled. Okay. So go into some compression bandaging, okay? On ours in Shropshire, we have the Actico range and we have the Ergo K2. Those are our two choice of bandages in Shropshire. I don't know what your choice is, as long as your rationale is effective compression bandaging for the patient, which those two are. So that will direct me, but then it'll equally tell me, keep reassessing. Don't keep that patient because when that exudate might become controlled, the limb shape restored, do we have to continue in bandaging? No, we can put in full therapeutic compression hosiery or the wrap systems. And you heard about the wrap systems this morning, haven't you? Um, again, full therapeutic compression. Easy to apply, doesn't have to be an RGM. And I'll model you on in a minute. But using that pathway to considerably guide your practice. And if, if it's exudate and all those other factors, despite compression and not being controlled, it will target you to talk about, could there be potential that there is a local infection in there? Or there's some underlying comorbidities that might be contributing to it. So another example, again, is an, I keep getting these females up here, don't we? It's never a man. I haven't shown, oh, I did, I showed you the man earlier. Venous leg also superficial sloughy tissue, reduced compression, it's not painful, a good ABPI of 0.8, moderate swelling, but it is heavily exuding. 
Um, once we've assessed and addressed, undressed the patient's wound, I don't mean the patient by that, by the way. It does look like we've assessed the patient and dressed them, doesn't it? I.e. not the wound, the patient. Um, ideal compression. Use your algorithm again. All I'm doing is taking it to help you. And again, you can be prescriptive on your algorithm. You can download it and change it so that your staff then go, yeah, I know what I need to do. But it will keep taking you through that reassessment process. Okay. If exudate levels have reduced, what would you do next? Go back to the pathway. Okay. If there's a large amount of reducible edema, no. I can go into a hose rekit or I can go into a ready wrap system. But I will say... I've come full circle now for over the last 12 months. I'm using more of the wrap systems um, for even patients who can't tolerate bandaging um, for the heavily exuding wounds because, again, um, it's better than nothing. But let's have a look at this patient. This patient was in, followed the algorithm. Well, didn't follow the algorithm, I tell a lie. This patient was in a Aptico short stretch bandaging because he had a VLU. But why is he not healing? He's in compression, gold standard. Venous leg ulcers, full compression. Why is this limb not healing? What would you want to do if I came into you today and I applied compression bandaging to your leg and I walk out, what would you want to do if your leg was like that? Take it off and give it a good scratch, wouldn't you? Because look, this hyperkeratosis that's then forming wet plaques as well, bacteria, fungi, it doesn't have to be wet to multiply the bacteria and microorganisms. Okay, so what next then? What could we do differently? Take him out of the bandaging and put him into a hosiery kit because I'm still giving full therapeutic compression. Okay, remove the hyperkeratosis, but I haven't got much time. And actually, I don't want the RGN going in twice a week. I need to skill mix. So let's look at what I can use, the monofilament pads, good emollients. And that's all it was. Really good emollients, skin care, and compression. But guess what? When we gave the man a tub of cream and said, roll your hosiery kit down every day and put cream on. Can I do that? Yes, you can. It's your leg. And because when it's healed, you'll be doing that every day anyway for life. See where we're coming from? And the patients love the fact that you could roll the hosiery kit down, put a real big lump of cream on and give it a good... You know, and it stopped to meet you, and it felt more comfortable. And they put hosiery on, and they thought, I'm normal. I can get my shoe on. I can wear clothes that I didn't wear before. And I can go to the supermarket, and some stranger doesn't stop me and say, excuse me, what's up with your leg? Because guess what? When you've got your arm or your leg in a bandage, what does everybody do? Strangers stop you in the street. What's the matter? I had a patient who said that to me. She said, the one thing that this has made a difference with, and I was thinking, oh, she's going to say, my ulcer healed, I could get my shoe on. She says, I can, she says, I'm a private lady, I live alone, I go to Morrison's once a week, and every week I go into Morrison's, people used to stop me and ask me what was wrong with my leg. If I mentioned leg ulcer, they go, ooh, my mother or aunt died from one of them, and they smile, don't they? You know, and she says, why, what, I don't want to talk, I want to be normal. She went into the hosiery kit with an ulcer, but because from the pathway she could, it was suitable. And she knocked my door one day, because she was actually under the practice nurses, and stopped me and said, I just want to thank you. And she, she was very quiet lady, didn't say a lot. And I thought she was going to say because her ulcer was improving and her skin was dramatically improved. And she said, I can just go shopping without anybody stopping me. Nobody talks to me and I love it. I feel normal again. So, this is the impact in practice. So, you remember my good friend, best friend Leanne, said to me when we were looking at this data, you know, dueling guesswork, that people hadn't been Dopplered and we hadn't got a true diagnosis and there's certain patients with venous leg ulcers that weren't in compression. No, this isn't happening in my area. And I've just done a 100 patient cohort study and I hopefully I can share this with you next year. Um, because I was of the same philosophy. But before she implemented the leg ulcer algorithm, she did a quick look at one community base with her, her colleague, who's a community nurse, and looked at 34 patients with leg ulcers. And those 34 patients with venous leg ulcers took up seven, approximately 74 visits a week. And I think you can almost work that one out. It's more or less twice a week, sometimes three. Okay? Before they put in the evidence, best practice, and the leg ulcer algorithm, none of those patients had a diag true diagnosis. Okay? And if you look at Julian's guest's recent work, which is 2018, it's saying the same thing. We're lacking diagnosis. Only 34% of those patients had had a Doppler or an ABPI. Again, it fits in nicely with 
Julian Guest's findings, doesn't it? Only 13% were in compression and only 7% were moving along the healing trajectory. She was horrified, but she implemented the evidence with this team. This was three months later. 76% had now got a true diagnosis. 76% had an ABPI. 83% were in compression, full compression, and 56% were healing. And that's the important, but in three months, the visits went from 74 visits to 42, which is a 43% decrease in activity. What can you do with an extra 43% of your time or your team's time? Okay. To me, it's the patient's words. My legs look normal and all of my patients say this, I can get my shoes on and that's so important. And if I'm, I've got to model it for you now and I'm sorry, I'm going to move off camera probably. But this is a ready wrap system that I've got on my leg. It does come with a foot system as well. So if you've got edema to the foot, you would use it. Ask me what I would prefer. I would prefer a hosiery kit or a ready wrap because I can self-manage or I can at least be part of that self-management with my partner or whoever. Or in care homes, nursing homes, those sort of areas. I forgot that there was anything wrong and I think that's important as well, isn't it? Um, and we haven't got the video because we were, did have a video but they've omitted my video so I'm really disappointed because there was a very short video just to play you um, from a patient's perspective but I don't know where it went so I can only apologise um, but it only, re I say only, it reiterates everything I've just said. So are there any questions because we have got a few minutes for questions now and please don't feel that any question is a silly question because if it's here and it's bothering you please ask it because somebody else is probably dying to ask it also. <coughs> any of you use hosiery kits? No? Are you happy to consider the use of hosiery kits? Can you see the benefits? But the benefits aren't just what, they're not what I'm saying that I do in Shropshire or Leanne does in Yorkshire. It's what evidence is saying out there. We all know the Venus Force study, it was a massive RCT. You know, so really, especially we should be aware of that and how that can impact on practice. So when I went to my medicines management team and discussed the, having more hosiery kits available and when the wrap systems came out, wrap systems, and they went, the cost of that is enormous. I showed them the cost of a 12-week 12 12 treatment in one system and a 12-week system in bandaging. And it goes without saying, but to me, it's the biggest cost saving to the patient. Yes. Um, we use we use Activa and ActiLymph because what I will say is make sure that the hosiery kit. There's British standard and European standard. What I will say, if the limb is a lot of edema or distortion or large limb shape, go for a lymph ActiLymph because they will be uncomfortable in the British standard. It's the weave, it's how they weave. So just know about which system you're using. But I, you know, that's the ones we use, but a full therapeutic hosiery kit is effective. When would I use? The liners. So, sorry, uh, good question. The hosiery kits come with a liner, so this is really silky, but it has 10 millimetres of pressure. And remember, I'm talking 40 millimetres of pressure. And the sock has 30, so together you've got 40 millimetres. The reason we're having good success with these is years ago we were advised to put everybody in a class 3 compression hosiery. We did struggle for patients to get them on, even clinicians to put them on. But now with the silky liners they really are much, much easier to apply. But what you've got to remember is as per your full compression bandaging, you're getting full therapeutic compression. Now, this lady, sorry, I don't know your name, has said, well, when would you use the liner? I have seen liners used on their own as giving, but always remember, you're just giving 10 millimetres of compression. Sometimes I've seen two per on, if I'm honest, so that's giving 20 millimetres of pressure, which is reduced. But always say, for how long? and why do you know what I mean I know the patients will go oh that feels lovely that's really nice but is it therapeutic enough okay if you don't want 40 millimeters of pressure but I will always say a true VLU go aim for 40 but if it's maintenance and they like the liner go for a liner which is a 10 and a class 1 which is about 17 and you've got 27 millimeters of pressure 
But guess what? The patient can get it on a lot easier with the liner. And the liner is quite nice against um, skin. If there's problematic problems with the skin, they, they like the liner as well. Because sometimes there is a little bit of friction from the hosiery. Any other questions? Yes. Bedtime, did you say? Excellent question. If a patient has an actual ulcer or wound, we do recommend that they sleep in them. So it's, it's a bit like a bandage. It's 24, 24 hour period, including the ready wraps. But really, if you don't want to, as long as it's the last thing they take off when their feet are in that bed and the first thing that is put on, so if they're in the care home, or, or self-care when the feet touch the floor because the edema will increase. Um, obviously, you can take it off for showering and bathing, um, if they can shower and bathe, but need to go straight back on. But really, if we've got ulcerations, we've found better results, and this is just, instant, you know, we've found better results if they remain in them. So treat it like a full compression kit. Um, and patients do simple dressing techniques underneath with advice and support and showing the triggers of what infection looks like and you know when to call and seek help any other questions oh thank you oh sorry one more if the legs leaking um if it's it probably will be leaking you can still use uh, uh, super absorbents under these certainly you can under the wrap systems you can have super absorbents etc the nice thing there is the wrap systems the the patient with teaching could if it was really leaking open the wrap system just change the outer pad if it's really high amounts use your pathway which actually suggests a term in bandaging first to get that down and minimize that but I have had some patients that, that have not wanted the bandages and we've gone down this system, but with super absorbent shoes. But I would get some advice on that as well. Is that okay? Well, absolute massive thanks to you all. Um, I know it's hard to get out for education and I'm sure most of you are doing this in your own time and won't get it back. I'd like to thank these guys though, because without free events, I'm, I'm, I think that's even the biggest struggle is trying to get funding. Um, but thank